The last few weeks um, have been pretty powerful experiences of worship, and uh, I just want to remind you, uh, one, one thing I was talking to George Bajakley about worship, and he made a statement that he probably doesn't remember even making to me, but it was powerful. He said, we we're talking about the church and worship, and he said, let the church worship, and everything else will take care of itself. So as the church worships, I, I just invite you to invite others into that experience. One of the most profound witnesses that you can have is to invite somebody into an authentic experience of worship. And, and it's okay if they don't, if, if a person who's outside the church or doesn't know Christ yet, doesn't understand all the lingo or, or sing or anything, but there's something powerful about even being in the middle of a, a, a pure essence of worship and so continue to, first of all, continue to be that church. And second of all, be relentless in your pursuit of people and to inviting them into that as a, as a first step towards Christ. So thank you for being that. Um, I was thinking back of the first fall that we were here. And uh, I was excited about the winter. I really liked the idea of having a winter uh, from Texas. I didn't really get a lot of snow. If it snowed there, it was more likely to be on Valentine's Day than it was to be around Christmas. So different different seasons different uh, feelings and we had a fireplace I was excited about using that and the first first fall we were really blessed by a lot of people in our congregation but there's one person that that stood out in my memory of that this 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 uh, week and that person was Carol Fassey and Carol Fassey did two things that fall the first thing Carol did was he brought a huge truckload of firewood to my house and dumped it off now I had never I didn't fully appreciate that because I had never cut much firewood uh, but subsequent winters made me very thankful for Carol's dumping a huge load of oak firewood in my driveway. It was, it was awesome. The other thing is, uh, it was a Wednesday night, and Carol Fassi called me, or Kevin called, I don't know who called me, but somebody, Carol was, was at the heart of this, uh, and, and he was on his way here to church that night, and he asked me if I wanted a deer, and I was surprised because I didn't know Carol was a deer hunter, and come to find out Carol wasn't a deer hunter. But the car in front of him had hit a deer, and, <laughs> and he was going to pick it up and bring it to me, which he did. I, I forgot how we got it here, but, but Carol was uh, serving his pastor and blessing me in some really neat ways. Um, and, and I just remembered that as I started thinking about what it means to serve each other in the church. Two weeks ago, we started this series called Visible Gospel. So let me revisit that idea with you real quick. Uh, the main idea is that when the church truly loves one another, when we really get what it means and what it looks like to love each other sacrificially, sincerely, that the world that's watching us sees the reality of our relationship with God. They see something that is, that is tangible in, in, our, in our faith about, in Jesus. And, and Jesus said this, he said, when we do that, he said, by, all, by this, by loving one another, all men will know that you are my disciples. And so we're talking, we're taking this up close and personal close look at, at what it means to love each other in that kind of way, in a way that makes the gospel or our profession about Jesus, the good news about who he is and what he's done, it makes that visible, not just verbal. It, it, Jesus declared that when we love each other, not just when we have the right doctrines or the right belief systems or the right commitments, but that when we love each other, it makes the gospel about him visible. And last week we said the first part of loving each other was about, was about what it meant to encourage each other, to truly to encourage each other verbally and with our actions. One of the greatest ways we can encourage each other is, is uh, in our attendance and making sure when it said in the book of Hebrews, don't, don't give up meeting together, but encourage each other all the more. And so we said that it's really, really encouraging to be uh, amidst the people who are on a sincere journey with, with Jesus not people who feel like they have to have all the rough corners smoothed off, all the right language in place, not with people who feel like they got to put on their best face every Sunday, but just with people who are real on a journey to know and become like Jesus. Very, very encouraging. Uh, this week, we're going to look at another part of what it means to love each other sacrificially in the church. Because we can just say, right, we can just say that, that you're supposed to love each other and we could assume what that looks like. And, and we would probably, if we did that, we would probably come to some mistaken conclusions about what love is primarily about in the church or what it means or what it looks like to really love each other. I think a lot of us would have a tendency 
to, to really base that up a large part upon, upon our feelings and our emotions or how we feel about one another. And while that does come and it follows some other things, loving each other is much more about an action uh, and, and maybe an attitude or a posture that we take towards, towards other people in the congregation. So we're going to dig into that a little further today. We really do, uh, I believe this, uh, live in the greatest country in the world. With all of the faults and all of the problems and, and weaknesses that we have, I could still say with great certainty, I think that, that we live in the greatest country in the world, and here's why. I think we live in the greatest country in the world because, because of the profound freedom that we enjoy. There is a depth and breadth of freedom that, that very, very few places have. And that freedom gives us incredible opportunity to choose. Now, choosing something is having the freedom to choose something is, comes with a double-edged sword, doesn't it? Because with liberty to choose comes, choose right, comes the liberty to choose what? To choose what's wrong. And so the freedom can't be without that. Real freedom has to involve that kind of choice when there is right and wrong. And we have that in the United States of America. And we suffer the consequences and we enjoy the victories of good choices and bad choices together as a nation. We would all admit, right, that there are good choices and there are bad choices. We would all admit that there really are right choices and wrong choices. Not all of them are characterized in such black and white fashion, but, but there is by the nature of choice, right and wrong, good and bad. There are choices that help us or hurt us. There are choices that help others or hurt others. And we in, the, in this country have that freedom to choose that. But we're also free, spiritually speaking. When we come, because one of our freedoms, right, is to choose to know and follow Christ in this country without any imposition or oversight or mandate from a government or any other authoritative body. So we have this choice to know and follow Jesus in this country. And when a person does that, when a person comes to know and follow Jesus, they experience another level or even greater level of freedom. And that is the freedom from the power and the penalty of sin. When you place your faith in Christ, when you determine that you are broken and lost and helpless to redeem yourself or to buy a position back with God or earn it, and you instead throw yourself on the mercy and the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you are set free. Jesus said it is for freedom that, that the Son makes you free. And the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. And what he's talking about primarily is this spiritual freedom and this freedom, this liberty that we get from the power and the penalty of sin. You and I... Whoever we are in this room who know and follow Christ have been set free from the power and the penalty of sin. Now, the same choice is at play. You and I being free to choose now. Now, we weren't. When I was 16 years old, I was a slave to sin because I didn't know Christ. And I didn't have any choices there so that sin ruled my life. It was my master. I didn't have freedom. I didn't have liberty. I couldn't choose anything but sin because I hadn't been set free by Christ. And if you sit here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, to know and follow Him, become like Him, the, the Bible would say that you too are still in slavery to sin. But once you place your faith in Christ, which is a choice you've been given, you are free from that. You are free to choose. Now, the same risk is at play. You can choose right and you can choose wrong. You can choose good and you can choose bad. Not all choices are characterized, again, in such black and white terms. I understand that there are some choices that are just choices and they don't really have a right or wrong or, or black and white, but more of them do than we would suspect. And what I want to talk to us about is that freedom of choice of how do you use your spiritual freedom today? How are you using your freedom today from your old nature your freedom from the power and the penalty of sin. What choices are you making in that freedom? I would back up just one more step and say, are you aware today that you've been set free? Are you really cognizant of the fact that as a follower of Jesus, you are free? You are not a slave to sin anymore. You don't have to choose its dictates or mandates. You don't have to subject yourself to its leadership. You don't have to give in to its cravings and its lusts and its desires. You're free from that. How 
today then are you using your freedom? I want you to look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13 because the Apostle Paul gives us some really sage advice to say the least. Some really clear words in one verse. He says some powerful things. So in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, we're going to look at that and that answer and how Paul responds to that. Would you stand today? So we would read this as reflectively as we can right here. This is God's word, not ours. It is without any error. It is with great power and authority that we would read it and subject ourselves to it. And here's what it says. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. Father, in this one simple verse, there is so much to dig into and so much to say and learn and to experience from you. Now just make your voice and your wisdom very clear to us. I'm going to ask you to speak with authority, with grace, and with power. Power that would motivate and inspire us to know and follow and become much like Jesus. I will ask that in his great name. Amen. Thank you. All right. God called us to freedom in Christ. Many people don't, don't understand that Christianity is, is characterized by freedom. Many people would resist it because they think if they embrace Christianity, they embrace a set of rules and they embrace a set of thou shalt nots, if you will. So they almost view it as a step towards bondage instead of a step into incredible liberty and freedom. But, but Paul says here, he says, you've called to freedom. Brothers, you've been, you were called to freedom. So it was through, through Jesus that we've been invited. And actually, this freedom has been purchased for us and given to us. It's a freedom from the power and the penalty of sin, as I said. And because we were enslaved to sin, this is significant. It, it is a good thing. It is a really healthy thing to do. And I invite you to do it right now. Is to think back to before you knew Christ. And to realize that what was going on in your life was, was this mandate, this enslavement to a nature that did not have anybody's best interest in its, of, except to satisfy itself. It was profoundly selfish. It was profoundly ungratifying. It, it, there's no doubt in my life, when I look back to those times as a teenager when I tried to do what I thought would satisfy myself, I never felt myself being satisfied, only spurred on to look for something else. There could be no greater gain for a person who's a slave than to gain their freedom. Wouldn't you agree? That if you're a slave to something, that the greatest gift you could be offered is freedom. And freedom is characterized by, as we said, choice. In Christ, we find that. Now, Paul says we need to choose wisely with this freedom. He says, brothers, don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. So the nature of freedom is choice, as I just said. Now, I get the chance to choose how I'm going to live my life instead of somebody else dictating how I'm going to live my life, somebody, some other nature mandating how I'm going to live my life. Now, Paul cautions us right at that point, knowing that the freedom brings risk and danger to choose wrong, to choose poor, to choose danger. Your choices, I know from experience, my choices can bring harm upon me. It can bring harm on other people. It can bring pain. It can bring suffering. It can bring, it can bring hardship that is unintended. My choice has a great responsibility, this freedom to have to have the ability to choose what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say, how I'm going to invest my time and energy what my focus is going to be, all that freedom that I have has incredible responsibility. You're free to speak what you want tomorrow. All day long, if you go to school, if you go to work, if you go to talk to your neighbor, you are free to choose your words. Just know that your words can tear down or they can build up. You're free. 
But that freedom comes with a sobering amount of responsibility. And, and Paul's cautioning us right at that point, and he's saying that, that we have to make sure that we don't turn our freedom back into an enslavement to the flesh. Because here's what's going on. You're set free from your old nature, but your old nature is still with you. Romans 7 makes this really, really clear, that there becomes a battle, that the old nature is not immediately gone. The sinful human self doesn't just wither up and die the moment a person comes to faith in Christ. There becomes this, this battle, this inner turmoil sometimes of, of the new nature dominating the old nature, the new nature being Christ in you and the old nature being your selfish, sinful nature. That battle takes place. And Paul is saying you can actually be set free from your sinful human nature only to choose to go back into slavery to it. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Jesus would purchase our freedom to choose to know and follow him, to become about his agenda, and we would choose to go back into it. was the essence of the Galatians' problem at this point, that they were choosing to go back into this old nature dominated by selfish focus and, and pride and external appearance. So our flesh is still alive, right? No one would deny that. No one, no one that knows Christ would, would ever say, hey, I don't have a temptation to sin anymore. My human nature, my flesh is just gone. Now, the cool thing is, and the, the hopeful thing that I would insert right now is the more we become like Jesus, this is why, church, it is so, so, so vitally important we understand this concept that, the, that Christianity is about becoming like Jesus, not just learning to behave well. Because as we become, our heart changes. As our heart changes, our desires change. And the less we even become desirous to go back to the old nature. But early on in our lives, and, and without a lack of, with a lack of discipleship and, and spiritual disciplines that lead to this kind of transformation, oftentimes we find ourselves in a lifelong battle against the flesh. And we just think this is how it is. We've got to hold on and just keep staving it off. And then we fail and then we feel guilty and we confess and we go back. And then our heart is constantly in this tug of war against right and wrong. But the progressive nature of becoming like Jesus should alleviate that battle and we should gain victory more and more. And we can, not just through right behaviors, but by becoming more like Jesus. But Paul said, don't right now. For those that are in the early stages of that, and that doesn't mean in terms of years. That means in terms of spiritual progression. Paul said, don't let your freedom from sin lead you to the choice to go back into slavery to the sinful nature. You think, well, I would never do that. But, but we do. I do. There are times that I do this because it doesn't mean that I'm going to go start lying. It doesn't mean that I'm going to watch stuff on TV that I shouldn't watch. It might. But it doesn't have to mean the big things. It doesn't have to mean these overt, kind of blatant, in-your-face kind of sins. It can mean just an inward focus that I want to please me. More than anybody else in the world, I want to please me. I want to make sure I'm taken care of. I'm going to use my freedom to make sure I stay free, to make sure I choose me. I've got to watch out for me. And Paul says, no, don't do that. That's a return to the sinful nature. Don't revert to that. Don't go back to that. And he says, instead, choose to use your freedom to serve one another. So in that next phrase, when he says, brothers, don't, use, don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. Now listen to this. This is really cool. In the original language, it talks about Make yourself, the language there is to make yourselves slaves to one another. Don't be a slave to the sinful nature. Instead, become a slave to serving one another. Well, I got to tell you, when I say that, there's still a part of my flesh that that just rubs up against. It says, that doesn't feel all the way safe to make myself a slave to somebody else, 
It doesn't mean that, that they crack the whip over you. It doesn't mean actually that they even know that you are a slave to their best interest. It means that we begin to adopt a, a posture towards other people in the church, a position or an attitude that allows us to constantly think or to regularly think of what's in the best interest of other people that I know and that I'm on this journey with. What is in their best interest instead of just what's in my best interest? Now, if you be honest with me and, and really real with yourself, you'll know that this is a tug of war. And you, you can stand there and say, yeah, I understand that battle. And Paul says, through love, because of love, because you've first been loved by him, because the nature and the essence of the church is to love one another, through love we choose to serve one another. Loving each other is what this is all about. Now, as I pointed out last week, I said, rightly so, the church has been really admonished and pushed to have an external focus, to think about the world that is around us and not to isolate ourselves or to insulate ourselves from the ugliness and the, and the broken relationships and the messed up lives that we have to serve other people. We have to give ourselves to the mission of helping other people who aren't all tidied up in a church come to know and become like Jesus. Absolutely, but what we're saying is that the first and maybe the most pivotal step that we're overlooking is how important it is to love one another, to encourage one another, and then to choose to serve one another's best interest. Not my own, not serve my own best interest, but to think, what is the best interest of my brother? What's the best interest of my sister here? The almost exclusive barrier, and I need you to tune closely into this, okay? Because this is where we'll win or lose this game, I believe. The closest, the, uh, the most exclusive, almost exclusive barrier to this expression of love towards one another is our tendency to be obedient to our feelings. I want you to pay attention to that statement for me. If you're going to move from serving to choose, choosing to serve yourself with your freedom in Christ, you will have to understand that we can no longer be obedient, primarily obedient to simply our feelings. We, need, we tend to, in great part, I think, live by this rule that feelings dictate our actions. Now, you might disagree, but the largest reason that people don't stay married today is because they don't feel like staying married today. The largest reason that people do things that are harmful is because that's how we feel. So we respond to our feelings. We don't feel like we love this person anymore. So we take action based on the feeling. We don't feel like we want to work at this place anymore. So we take actions on our feelings. And we don't consider right and wrong at that point. We consider how we feel. And sometimes when we're angry at someone, we, we, we just act out of our feelings and we respond to our feelings and we say things or we do things that are not helpful to anybody, but they were enslavement, they were, they were, they were uh, prompted by our enslavement to our feelings, that we do what we feel like doing. This is, a, this is the culture of the, of the West. It's not just the culture of covenant, it's the culture of the West that we're inundated in and, and it's a much bigger picture and I do believe we really, really struggle with feelings dictating our actions. And now, to do what we're going to talk about doing, and, and actually all through the Christian life, we have to turn that around. We have to literally flip that tendency to be obedient to our feelings on its head. The only antidote to this problem is to practice being obedient to the truth of God's Word instead of our feelings. Trusting that obedience to truth brings about the right feelings. Do you do that? Do you trust that if you're obedient, simply obedient to the Word of God, that in your step of obedience to the truth, that your feelings would come in alignment to your obedience? Instead of saying, well, I know what God's Word says, but man, I want this. I feel this. And my feelings are so strong that maybe I'm interpreting the truth through my feelings. I've had a lot of people tell me this. They don't say it in those words. But there'll be something that's clearly outside the realm of God's will. And they'll say, but God revealed this to me. 
in my personal quiet prayer time, God revealed that this is a unique situation. I am a unique person, and I have a unique standard, and in this situation, this word doesn't apply to me, and I get to fly outside the bounds of the truth. It's never right. It's never right. God never says give up. God never says quit. God quit. God never says lash out in anger. God never says be profoundly selfish. Paul said, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He's talking about his flesh. I, I discipline my flesh. I, I make my flesh do what God's word tells me to do, and I trust that as the result of that, that my feelings and my, my, my emotions and even my thoughts will come in alignment to that truth. I don't feel like it initially, so I have to discipline and practice doing it. Now, what I'm getting at, church, is that you are not going to wake up tomorrow morning having heard this sermon and go, I feel like giving up myself in the best interest of other people. You will not wake up and feel that way. Your flesh won't permit it. And the church hasn't done an adequate enough job of teaching you how to practice the spiritual disciplines that lead to the right feelings and thought life. So we have to begin to practice things that don't feel natural or good or right. Your, your flesh is going to buffet this. It'll resist it, I promise you. And the turning point will be when you and I determine that God's truth can and will dictate what we do or don't do, not just our feelings, that we subject our feelings to the counsel of God's word instead of subjecting the counsel of God's word to our feelings. I'd lie to you today, and, I, and, and it's tempting to lie to you, to say I didn't struggle with this anymore. But there are many, many times that my feelings are so powerful and my heart has not been fully formed in Christ's likeness that it's very easy to act out of my flesh. But Paul says the choice that we now have with our freedom from sin boils down to a choice of choosing to serve one another in the church, to love one another through service, which is the heart of what Christianity is about. Or we can choose to serve our sinful natures. That is, you don't have to go out and rob a bank. You don't have to go out and hurt somebody. Choosing to serve the sinful nature is nothing more than a choice to think of you first and others second. Your pride, your ego, your image, your desires, your wants, your wishes, your reputation first. And others are second. If you've never practiced putting others ahead of yourself, if you have never learned, if you've never lived like a, a servant to the best interest of other people in the church family, it's not going to come very easy to you. You know, it's just like this. If a person who is massively out of shape, not all that unlike myself, decides because the doctor says, you need to get in shape or bad things are to come. So I determined that the next week I'm going to start, let's say, running a mile. When before, running 100 yards was exhausting. So I get up on Monday morning and I begin to run. And I know in my head it's the right thing to do. What else is going to be going off in my head and my body? My body is going to be screaming, you're crazy. Stop this. This hurts. This feels bad. It can't be good. Don't do it. This is wrong. And your whole body's going to be going, there's not enough oxygen in, in your lung. And so you get this cramp in your lungs and your, and your blood is not, is not fully oxygen. You get this cramp in your side. You might get a headache and, and everything seems like I'm trying to get to feel physically better. But right now I'm feeling physically worse by trying to do the thing that makes me feel physically better. So typically we stop and say that can't be good. It hurts too much. Have you ever been around a person who's struggled to stop smoking? My mom smoked her whole life, and I don't know how many times she tried different things. Some of them were profoundly grotesque, putting a 
They're all their cigarette butts in a jar and having to look at them or smell them. It cured me. I don't know what it did for her, but I was like, I'm never, ever, ever going to smoke. Can you put that thing away somewhere? <laughs> but a person that stops smoking begins, or, or many, many addictions, begin to feel an immediate buffeting of their flesh that says, no, this is wrong. Give me more nicotine. Give me more this. And, and you begin to hurt. And it can physically hurt. It can feel exactly opposite of what is really taking place, which was healing and restoration and a move towards health. I'll, I'll just use Mike as an example, Inman, who's really put a damper on my love for donuts. <laughs> Mike's making a, making a decision to eat better, much to my chagrin. And initially, you know, I remember initially Mike was like, well, no, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to eat that. Every now and then we'll bring donuts in and He'd just, you know, kind of almost shut his door and like, I'm going to walk away from that. And today I cannot talk that man into eating a donut. I could wave it under his nose, which I have. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I have, haven't I? I'm just being honest. Yes. <laughs> yes, you have done that. But now, because he's, he's gotten sugar out of his diet to the same degree, it's just not as tempting. He doesn't really, which I don't understand. I just take it by faith. It's a reality for him that you don't like a donut, that it's not a temptation to eat a donut. Man, one of our youth walked by this morning with a box of donuts. They just paused in front of me and I snatched one of them up. And then they said, I was going to ask you if you wanted one of those. I knew you were going to ask me and I was just blessing you by saying yes. But <laughs> point being, point being that, that, that you can get, even physically you can get to the point where what old habits aren't appealing to you anymore. That, that, that the sugar and the sweet just didn't, your taste has changed. And, and church, what I'm telling you is it takes a time of transition that we have to choose to be obedient to the truth. And then things begin to change. It is essential, it's important, it's paramount that we love each other radically, sacrificially. It's, it's not an option. It's not the higher level of existence that only a few should attain to. This is the, the teaching of the scriptures of how the church should function. Listen, I want to tell you something. The more you feed yourself, you'll notice this, the less satisfied you get. The cravings of the flesh are not satisfied by attention. They're enlarged. The more you focus on yourself, the more you're going to want to focus on yourself, in part because no amount of self-focus will satisfy you. No amount of self-indulgence is going to Quell your craving for self-indulgence. None. If you found contrary, I'd invite you to stand up and tell us that testimony. You know as good as I will, bigger houses don't do it, more money don't, doesn't do it, better clothes, newer computer, more, more stuff, doesn't do it. Self-focused desires only grow larger with attention. Today, your challenge and my challenge in this church family is to choose to be obedient. That's really the essence of the challenge. You're going to have to just simply do this. Take God at his word. This is the right thing to do. And if we're obedient to truth, feelings will follow. You're going to have to trust that because it's not going to feel that way initially. I'm going to challenge you to serve one another in a brand new way. And as we kick off these G2 groups, our growing and going groups, they're just small groups, ministry called growing or going and growing, G2. All that's about is we believe that, that transformation happens in motion as much as it does in a classroom, studying and learning. That we go and we grow at the same time. That we serve one another, we serve the body at large and our G2 groups and we serve the community at large. Our, our, fo our G2 groups are focused on that. And as you get involved in those, as we urge you to get involved in that, it's not because we want you to prop up a ministry. It's not for us, we're trying to set some kind of goal for, for enrollment, but we believe with all of our hearts that these small groups, these ministries are core, they're essential to this kind of process of learning to be obedient to truth and not just to ourselves and our selfish feelings. We're not asking you to get into a group and divulge your deepest, darkest secrets within a week or two or to stand in, you know, in some mystical circle holding hands and singing Kumbaya. We're not asking you to give, out, give the warm fuzzies and, and have intimate relationships with everybody in the group, but we are asking you to go make a friend or two. 
connect with somebody else. Let the relationship or the friendship just take course and take place. And as you do that, you have an opportunity to look for ways to do what we're talking about this morning. And here's how that can go. In fact, here's how it should go. That you begin practicing asking the Holy Spirit to give you guidance and prompting of how to serve one another. And even just starting in that group. Or even in the church as a whole. That, that the Holy Spirit would have in mind and be so good and so faithful, so present, so wise, so all-knowing as that as the, the Holy Spirit could put on your mind what you could do for somebody else. Now, here's, here's how this generally works in my life, and I'll just see if it translates into your life. Uh, initially, when I began to practice this, it felt kind of strange. Like I would pray, Holy Spirit, just show me something I could do for somebody else. And I would try to listen. And a thought would pop into my head. And then I would go through this, like, well, I'm not sure if that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, or that could be me. Is that just a crazy idea or is that the Holy Spirit? All right, track with me here. You just asked an all-knowing, ever-present, indwelling Spirit of God to show you something. All right? The result was a thought popped into your head. The challenge is to assume just assume that was the Holy Spirit. Now, if it's crazy, like, you know, the Holy Spirit said, go slap your wife, you should probably check that one out against Scripture and probably call a good friend who could talk you out of that. I mean, within reason, you don't, you don't want to just go, you know what? I believe I'm going to slap my mother-in-law today. The Holy Spirit told me to. She needs a good slapping. That's not smart. Okay? But if the Holy Spirit said, hey, would you go grab your son before they go to school and pray with them? Was that me or is that the Holy Spirit? Hey, you're like me. You're not that spiritual to think of that on your own. That is the Holy Spirit. Just go with it. Is it going to do any harm if you're wrong? The Holy Spirit going, Father, they went and prayed with their son. I didn't tell them to do that. God, what are we going to do with that mess? I mean, what are you going to do? What do you have to lose? The Holy Spirit, so you ask him to prompt you, you get an idea, you take obedient action because you know it's within the realm of God's will, and pretty soon you begin to learn the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's called practicing. You just practice. That's what Paul said, I discipline my body. And if we would do that, if we would just make a, and that's your challenge this week, if you would just begin to do that this week, Learning to listen to the Holy Spirit on things like this. Man, some amazing stuff would happen in our midst. Now, I always say this, and it's not to rescue you. It's really not. It's just because it is the truth. Much of this takes place at Covenant already. I know there are people sitting here going, we do that. We've been working on that. We're doing that. And I commend that. I celebrate that with you. But I want it to be like a wildfire because I think the Father wants it to be like a wildfire. It catches, it becomes the culture. It inundates us, it characterizes us. Man, you people walk in here and they are swept away by the love that has permeated each other's hearts for one another. That they would go, those people love each other. Look at how they encourage each other. Look at how they meet together regularly. Look at how they serve one another. And the Holy Spirit may say, get involved in Awana. And Betsy, I'm telling you, she's telling you that the Holy Spirit said, get involved in Awana. I'm just <laughs> taking it on her word. The Holy Spirit may say, take a sack of groceries to that single mom. Go to that young couple who has two young kids and hadn't been on a date for three months and babysit. The Holy Spirit has this swath of opportunities for you to serve other people in this congregation. And it's so important that you do that because the people who are outside considering looking at Christ are watching the nature of our relationships, not just listening to the, to the words that we espouse. And they need, church, listen to me, they need a visible gospel. We live in a biblically illiterate society. We haven't always, but we do today. And all that means is that the vast majority of people do not know the totality and the teaching of Scripture. And it is very important that they see it in action as well as hear it from our lips. I'm not saying one or the other. I'm saying verbal and visible. And part of what makes it visible is how we treat each other. It is not wrong. It is good. It is essential. 
So your challenge this week is pay attention to those ideas. This is part of bells. It's in your, it's in your worship, your, your um, what's that thing called? Bulletin. There's an acronym that our G2 groups focus on, BELLS. You've heard me talk about it before if you've been here at all uh, on the recent days, but blessing other people, eating or engaging with other people, that is in terms of going on maybe a, a step deeper in a relationship where you're listening, you're, you're talking more than just the weather, you're not giving counsel or anything, but you're, you're getting to know somebody, which typically happens a little better over a meal or coffee, or something like that. Then we're learning to listen to the Holy Spirit. That's the first L in that acronym. And then we're learning Jesus. That we're not just getting to know about Jesus, we're learning who Jesus is to us and a relationship with us. And then the, the S is that we live a sent life. That is our, our perspective on life changes to know that I've been sent into this world as an ambassador for Christ. I'm not just here as a provider for my family. I'm not just here as a, as a, as a per person at this job or a person at this school that I am I, I'm on a mission. And, and that learning to listen to the practice listening to the Holy Spirit is what, where this one hits. And I just want you every day this week to spend one to two minutes. I challenged my G2 group to this. I don't know how long did we do that for. It was 10 minutes or something last time we met. But just to be still and quiet and listen to the Holy Spirit. But if you could do it for one or two minutes and just then take a chance and respond to what pops into your brain. Don't argue. Don't try to figure it out. Just do it. If it's in accordance with what you think the Scripture is teaching, you have the means to... Now listen, I, wanted, I do want to say this. If the Holy Spirit says, go give $1,000 to the neighbor and you have, you have $40 to your name, okay, then you, you, it's fair to say, okay, I will do that. Holy Spirit, as soon as you give me $1,000, I will give it. Okay, that is that God is not going to ask you to give of what you don't have or he will promise the provision for what you don't have first, okay? So I'm not... Don't... don't don't read into this more than that is there. Oftentimes, I think initially in these baby steps, there will be very practical, very things that you can say yes to immediately. Okay? If you have questions about the prompting that gets into your brain or the thought, the, the idea, then call a trusted spiritual advisor or leader. Call the church. We'll help you. Call a G2 group leader. They will help you. An elder or deacon or just a, a trusted friend that you know will give you solid spiritual advice. Check it out. There's nothing wrong with that if there's any questions. But I don't want you to just take a chance and practice it. Pray for the Spirit's guidance and then take action on that and just see what happens. Now, the, the unique thing here, and this sounds so selfish, but it is not. It is important. The unique thing I'm asking you to do is to pray about how you can serve each other in the context of this congregation, not exclusively, I'm not saying pull all in your efforts and be internally focused and exclude the world around us. This should be both and, okay? But this week, I am asking you to pay particular attention to how you can serve one another. It may be involved in a ministry. It may be just serving another person in this congregation through what God has provided you, you can give to them and share, whether it's time or energy or wisdom or material goods, okay? Church, imagine this. Imagine, imagine the skeptics who are sitting at home today, and all they think of the church is that's where I was hurt the most. Do you know how many people are sitting in Topeka, Kansas today, and they will not step inside a place like this because they got hurt worse than they've ever been hurt in a setting like this? In a place where they're supposed to be safe, in a place where people are supposed to do what? Love each other, they got hurt really bad. Imagine what we could do by not shaming them, not arguing with them, not trying to tell them, tell them we're different. But what would happen if we could show them we're different? By serving each other. What if God would give them a glimpse into the heart of a congregation that was radically serving each other? What about the cynic that says, they're all religious phonies, and I don't like to go to a place where it's full of hypocrites. When people say that to me, I say, well, one more is never a problem, so come on, join us. But instead, what if, we, what if we put to death their fears of hypocritical, shallow religiosity by just radically loving each other? What if their view into the church, what if their chance encounter with 
Christians from covenant put on display this visible gospel where they were serving each other and encouraging each other, just loving on each other radically. That it was something real about their relationship with each other and i.e. God. Do you see how this could have a monumental impact? Do you see why it's essential and not optional? It wouldn't have been stated like it is if it wasn't. So let's go on that journey together, church. Take the challenge. Don't let your feelings lead the way. Take God at his word. Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you because we are weak. We really, really are. Jesus, you said, apart from you, we can't do this. And man, not that I was ever wondering, but you're so right. I can't do this without you. And more and more every day, I don't even want to try. I just want to fall into your arms and say, I can't do this, but you can. In my week, your strength really does become perfect. Father, there are many people here today who sincerely want to take this step. They just want to be obedient to your word, to the counsel and the guidance, the authority of your word. And their feelings are going to oppose, their sinful nature is going to oppose it. Give them the faith. Give them the courage. Give them the other people around them to spur them on to be obedient to truth and not to feelings. And then, Father, as we practice being obedient to truth, may we experience the emotions that are right and good and godly that satisfy us, that bring peace and contentment and joy. I'm going to trust you to do this for your, your people here today. Thank you for loving us unconditionally calling us together as a church family. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.